All right, hey guys. I'm here to talk about the problem of big data serving. I'll explain what the problem is, what the challenges are, what the advantages are of uh, doing big data serving. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about a platform that, an open source platform that I'm an architect of that uh, solves these problems for you, called Vespa. So first, what's big data serving? Then a bit about Vespa in general, and then we'll dive into architecture and so on. Uh, and finally, a bit about using Vespa if you want to solve your own big data serving problems. So I like to start by placing the problem in the big data landscape by talking about the maturity levels of uh, organizations, companies, and so on that are starting to use big data. At first, companies just create big data, but they don't actually use it for anything, at least not systematically. For example, if you have a movie streaming uh, company, then you log movie streaming events, which users are streaming which movies, but you're not using that data for anything uh, yet. Then you reach the analysis phase where uh, you pay people to look at the data and come up with recommendations about what you should do with your business or your product, right? For example, if you have the movie streaming system, you will have people looking at what people are streaming what kind of movies and then use that to inform editors about what movies they should recommend to people uh, manually. Then we reach the learning phase where you take your big data and automatically learn what the system should do. For example, if you have the movie streaming example, you have you look at which users are streaming what movies and you automatically learn what movies to recommend for what segments of um, users based on that, right? But you're still doing the learning offline beforehand, right? Finally, you reach the acting phase where you use your big data to make decisions in real time, just when you need that decision to be made, right? So in the movie example, that would be rather than pre-computing recommended list of movies, you compute the recommended movies for a given user at the time when the user is visit visiting your uh, application or site, right? So there's two, two kinds of sub-problems to the uh, automated decision, data-driven decision uh, stage. One is somewhat simple, which is you can make decisions just by looking at a single data item. For example, if you have some machine learning model that can compute uh, uh, say a quality score for each movie by looking at the data of the movie. You can compute the score just by looking at a single movie, right? So that's called streaming or sometimes stateless model evaluation. But the other case is um, where you need to look at all your data to compute what to do, right? So in the movie example, that would be computing the list of recommended movies. You can't just look at a single movie. You have to look at all the mo movies uh, to compute and compute your model over all the movies to create a list of recommendations, right? So there's many advantages to deferring decision making to real time when something needs to happen, right? Um, first of all, it simplifies your architecture because you don't need to pre-compute um, anything offline and then move it to your serving system and so on. And secondly, it makes it possible to use real-time data, data that are completely up to date to uh, take your actions. For example, in the movie example, you will include the recent movies and include the recent actions that the user took and other users took and so on. Uh, typically, when people do this kind of pre-computation in the learning phase, they end up with some complicated uh, federational systems where there's one system learning over all the data and pre-computing, 
and then you have some other system that is doing the real-time part, and then you try to combine it, which is complicated and awkward. Uh, lastly, you can do, you can make, take actions with much higher fidelity when you do things in real time. For example, in a movie example, uh, if you pre-compute recommendations, you can only do it for a particular number of segments of users, right? You can't pre-compute a recommendation list for every single user because it would be prohibitively expensive, right? And many of those users won't show up because you um, because they won't show up until you pre-compute the next list, you will have wasted all that computation. Um, so doing things real-time, you can do it with a higher fidelity, and you don't waste any uh, effort computing stuff that will never be used. But most companies are either in the latent phase or in the analysis phase uh, today, but even companies that I work with in Silicon Valley, internet companies, uh, usually are only on the learning phase, apart from a few very big companies that have very mature technology. Not many people are doing are moving to the acting phase for the case where they need to compute over lots of data. And why is that, given that there are many advantages? Well, it's because it's hard. It's hard because you need to combine state and you need to uh, scatter your queries over many nodes and compute in parallel and collect the results, which is also hard. And you need to do that with consistent low latency and also with high availability. Um, so it's a hard problem to solve from scratch, and most people assume they can't really do it. It's just too much work and too challenging, so they stay on the phase where they pre-compute stuff for serving. So I'm here to convince you that it's possible to do this uh, for, uh, even if you're not in one of these few big companies that are um, doing this well. Uh, so in, what, in a little bit more detail, what is needed to uh, do big data serving? Well, you need to, do, to take actions in real time, and that is user real time, which is you need to spend less time than the time that starts annoy actual humans, and that's about 400 milliseconds. So if you include some time for the front end and for network latency and so on, that translates to a latency budget of a couple of tens of milliseconds for the back end doing these computations. So that's a typical uh, latency budget you have. Uh, one of the advantages, as I mentioned, is that you can use data that are completely up to date to the current time when you do your computation. But to do that, you typically need to handle a, a high continuous rate of updates to your data. So you need to handle that while you're also doing the computation for the serving. Uh, since there are many users doing many things and so on, you need to be able to scale to a high uh, request rate. And obviously, since this is the domain is big data. You also need to scale to uh, large data sets. And you need to scale to both at the same time. Uh, and because these kind of systems are exposed directly to um, end users, they need to be always available, which translates to both being able to recover from hardware failures without disruption automatically and being able to change the system, evolve the system, change the data schemas, change the logic of the system, the machine learning models, and so on, without disruption to serving. And lastly, this system is part of a larger big data stack, which also includes the actual learning part and the big data batch processing systems, Hadoop, and so on. So it needs to integrate with these other uh, technologies in the big data stack. So that's a tall order if you're trying to build it from scratch, but luckily now you have Vespa, which is an open source platform for solving these problems. So you don't have to build it from scratch, you can do it with uh, Vespa. Um, Vespa is an open source technology, open source on Vespa.ai. Um, it actually came from 
the web search problem. If you think about it, uh, web search is the prototypical example of a big data serving problem. Um, the data you need to compute over is really large, and because you can't pre-compute the uh, result for every possible query that can come into your system, you need to defer all the computation until the point in time when the user is making a query, right? So that was a really hard problem to solve, but fortunately, at some point in time, slightly less than 20 years ago, uh, there started to be a lot of money flowing into the problem of solving web search. And that's why we could make big investments in solving these problems. Um, the company I come from, uh, which is in Norway, was acquired at about at this time by uh, Yahoo. And we started working on solving these problems um, and made two technologies to solve it. One was Hadoop for the offline computation part and then Vespa for the online serving part. Um, the core idea of both was to move the computation to the data rather than the other way around because this allows you to scale much higher because you avoid uh, um, bandwidth limitation and you can parallelize over all your data. Um, Hadoop, we were able to open source right at once, but uh, because of the complex IP rights around search, we weren't able to open source Vespa until uh, recently. But now we were finally able to do it. So now it's available for everyone. Um, so I'll talk slightly about what we use it for in uh, my company, which is now uh, Verizon, because we Vespa is used by companies all over, but I know these use cases particularly well because we, my team runs, uh, um, runs Vespa as a service for all these use cases. So we have, in my company, we have about 150 applications of Vespa um, that we run um, in a cloud, serving over a billion users, about 250,000 queries uh, per second. And one of the applications, by the way, is the third largest ad network after uh, Facebook and Google. So it's pretty large. Uh, believe it or not, you probably don't because you're European, but uh, yahoo.com is still one of the most visited uh, web pages in the world. So an example of uh, using Vespa for big data serving is these web pages, which consist of a list of articles and videos and so on that are personalized for every user that shows up uh, on the page based on their uh, browsing history. Uh, because we personalize for every user, we need to do it on the fly. We can't pre-compute for every single user for every point in time, just in case they show up. It would be way, way too expensive, right? So we compute the list of articles and videos and so on to show to the user at the time when they visit the page, and that is done by Vespa. And you can also see some ads in there that try to look like articles, which is also computed by a different uh, Vespa system. So there's a similar problem in the big data space that I need to um, separate big data serving from, which is part of analytics. When you're doing analytics, one of the things you want to do is to make queries to your system to learn about the data. right? Uh, that's not big data serving, that's analytics. And the differences are uh, listed here. When you do analytics, it's OK to have response times in a few, in a few seconds, because um, you pay. The, the users of the system are paid employees, so they can uh, wait a bit more. And for the same reason, the query rate is typically low. And for analytics, you are usually looking at time series data. so. You can do special optimizations for time series data that we cannot do in Vespa because we assume random writes to your data. You can update data in any way, add fields, change field values, and so on to your data. Um, and because your end users are typically employees, it's OK to have some downtime and some loss of data and so on, while in Vespa, it's high availability uh, no data loss, online redistribution, and so on. Um, 
so in all of those ways, the requirements so something like Vespa is higher, and that translates to higher costs, which shows up if you have trillions of data items that can still be done somewhat cheaply with, for analytics with something like Elasticsearch, while that starts to become um, expensive in the Vespa case, where you, have, you can't make these assumptions on the left. Um, also with analytics, you typically want to integrate with graphical user interfaces um, to explore your data, while in big data serving, it's more relevant to uh, integrate with tools for learning models like TensorFlow and so on. Finally, we assume that relevance and scoring is very valuable in Vespa, so we devote more storage space and more CPU to solving that problem really well. I'll get back to that uh, later if there is time. Um, okay, so now we know what the problem of big data serving is, and I've introduced Vespa, which is an open source platform that tries to solve these problems. And now we we'll look at the architecture of Vespa, which is also a more general lesson in the kind of architectural solutions that you need to have to solve this kind of problem. So in a little more detail, Vespa is a platform that allows you to do unstructured search over uh, text data as well as selection over structured data in a single query to find the data that is relevant mm -hmm. for your uh, computation. Um, it allows you to do scoring or relevance or inference with machine learned models or handwritten uh, models over all the data that you select. You can aggregate and organize the data that you select uh, on the fly uh, for a given query. Uh, and you can do this while you do real-time writes at a high sustain rate. Typically, we get from a couple of thousand to a couple of tens of thousands of writes per second per node. Um, the clusters are elastic and auto-recovering, so you can add and remove nodes and so on, and the uh, data redistributes in the background without disrupting serving. And as part of the system, we also have a processing logic container, because typically in these kind of applications, you want to have your own custom business logic that needs to be as close to the data as possible so that you can uh, process, do custom processing uh, quickly over the data. Um, and because these systems need to scale, they need to be able to consist of lots and lots of nodes. So it's a managed system where uh, the system itself takes care of um, running processes on the nodes it consists of, uh, and so on. So on a high level, the architecture looks like this. Uh, it's a two-level, uh, two-tier architecture. There's a stateless Java uh, container on top that handles the incoming queries, incoming writes, and so on, um, where you can also plug in your own uh, Java components to do additional processing and business logic, and so on. And then there's what we call content clusters that stores the raw data, uh, builds reverse indices, uh, redistributes the data, and uh, do the distributed part of executing queries and inferring in machine learning models and so on. And because we can have many clusters and many nodes and all of them running many processes and so on, it's too hard to set up this system manually. So we have a third component, which is the administration and configuration subsystem, which sets up and manages the nodes and clusters and processes for you. So what the user is seeing is what we call an um, application package, which is a complete description of the application you want to run on the system. That is deployed to the administration subsystem, which then sets up the system for you. So as I mentioned, the core, the whole point of something like Vespa is to be able to process over lots and lots of data with a small latency budget. So how do we do that? Well, there's three main things you can do. One is parallelization. When you have an incoming query um, coming to a 
container node, you um, fan out the query to all the content partitions that have uh, data relevant to that query in parallel, so that regardless of how much data you have, uh, each query will take the same amount of time because you just fan out to more nodes if you have more data. On each of the nodes, you also do uh, sharding over many cores in parallel for a given query. Um, that's typically something you want to do when you lower latency, right? Because it, it lowers throughput, but uh, it also lowers uh, latency. Um, so that's parallelization. Secondly, you prepare data structures at the right time and in the background to execute queries faster. So the most well-known example is reverse indices in text search, right? Where you invest more resources to invert the data so that it's fast given a query with some token you want to find. You can find all the documents that have that token really fast. But there are other examples like that as well, which is well less known. Um, Lastly, you, as I mentioned, can move as much execution to the data nodes as possible. There are two reasons you want to do that. One is to parallelize. If you do the execution on the data nodes, you do it in parallel uh, over all the nodes at the same time. But even more importantly, it allows you to compute over more data that you're able to send over the network within the time budget you have. So at, in large systems like this, the bottleneck becomes the network between the container nodes and the content nodes. So you can't really send all the relevant data over the network because it's way too slow, and you can't scale too many queries, even if you can do it fast enough for a single query. So you need to move the computation to the nodes and compute locally instead, and then solve the whole query as a distributed uh, um, execution problem. So when you have machine learned models, for example, in Vespa, you deploy them to the administration subsystem, which then copies the machine learned models to all the content nodes in the system so that they can be evaluated locally in parallel over all your content nodes. Here is an example of the result of that from uh, one of our performance tests where we compare running a TensorFlow model in Vespa with running it with TensorFlow serving, um, which is what people typically do if they don't uh, have Vespa. So Vespa and TensorFlow serving is about, uh, speed is about the same if you, if you uh, only compare uh, executing a model once over a single document. But if you evaluate the model with TensorFlow, you need to send all the data to the TensorFlow serving node, which is typically running in the container node or on a similar node like that, a stateless node. While with Vespa, you evaluate the TensorFlow model on all the content nodes in parallel. And that means that as you add more partitions, node having a subset of the data, you can process almost linearly more and more uh, data in parallel while meeting a given latency budget, right? While if you try to do this with TensorFlow serving, then it doesn't help you to add more content partitions because you'd still need to send all the data to uh, a single node for evaluation with TensorFlow. So you run out on network. It doesn't even help you to uh, have more TensorFlow nodes in parallel and shard between the TensorFlow nodes because you run out of network on the switches, right? So a little bit more detail on how the content nodes, which is the core of Vespa, uh, actually works. So Vespa is not running over a database or something like that. It's running over Linux and do all the data management, data storage, and so on um, on its own. So for those who know search, it's doing what's called document at the time evaluation over all the um, query operators in your query, which means that if you have a ranking model like a machine learn model, you have all the data 
available for a given document uh, at one point in time, which allows you to compute nonlinear models, which is important when you get into details. So there's two kinds of fields in Vespa. There's index fields, which are used for uh, unstructured text, where we maintain positional text indices, and which consists of dictionaries and posting lists. Um, but we also maintain, if you, if you know something about search, you know that text indices needs to be completely sorted, which means that inserts are very, very expensive. Basically, you can't do inserts in real time because you need to move all the data later than the thing you want to insert, right? which is very expensive. Um, so what Vespa do does in, to solve that problem is combine the best from both databases and uh, traditional search engines. So all the inserts go into B trees in memory, which are then um, flushed to disk and combined with uh, existing posting lists in the background. And when you do a query, you evaluate both or the B tree in memory and the posting lists on disk at the, in parallel at the same time, so that you uh, evaluate over all the recent data as well as old data. Um, for structured data, we also have what we call attributes, which are always in memory and available in a forward structure, like a column store. So you can access it directly in your machine learning models or ranking expressions um, and so on, and access it for sorting and grouping and aggregation and so on. Optionally, you can also have B trees over that data so that you can search it really fast. Um, since recent writes go into B trees in memory, they are not persisted, right? So we do the same things that databases do, which is also store the data in a transaction log so that if the node crashes, we can replay the transaction log to get back the uh, state you have, right? And since the transaction log is just a append, it can still be really fast, right? In addition to this, we have a separate store of the raw data of all the data items you write uh, to Vespa, which is used both for serving the data and for redistribution slash recovery if you lose a node or a disk or something like that. And that is stored in a structure similar to level DB, where you first have a unsorted data for your recent changes, right? And then you sort it in the background so that over time, most of your data is completely sorted. Uh, if you have multiple document schemas, you have one instance of all of this for every uh, document scheme. As I mentioned, Vespa automatically distributes the data over a set of nodes uh, with a certain replication factor, right? If you, if you have Typically, you want to replicate your data, right? So that if you lose a single node, you're not losing any data because you have other copies of the same data, right? So in Vespa, you can set a replication factor. Typically, you want two or three, depending on how much you want to pay for storage versus how bad it is to lose data, right? Um, optionally, you can also have multiple groups of nodes that stores some number of copies of all the data so that you can, in addition to fan out the queries over multiple nodes, you can also um, load balance over these groups so that you can handle a higher number of, a higher request rate uh, in total than a single group of nodes can handle. In some use cases like personal search, where every user only ever searches his own data, um, you also want to locate all the data of a single user on some small set of nodes so that you can execute a query for a given user only on that small set of nodes. So you can do things like that uh, optionally in addition. So Vespa auto distributes the data over according to the configuration you set for uh, replication and so on. And if you change your configuration to a different replication factor, change the groups, add or remove nodes and so on, then the data will 
redistribute in the background while you are handling your writes and query traffic without any disruption. Um, and all of this is based on the, what's called the crush algorithm, which is a standard algorithm in the literature if you're interested in the details. I won't really explain them here, but the point is that it allows you to distribute the data without having a dictionary of where each data item is. Um, so you can look up data, know where each piece of data is without having a dictionary or where the data uh, should be. Um, so you co can compute the location of each piece of data, but you have that property at the same time as you have the property that whenever you make a change to the distribution by adding or removing nodes, the uh, you will move the least amount of data between the nodes to uh, achieve the new wanted distribution. So another example of an algorithm like this is magic hash. So it's similar but done in a different way. So as I mentioned, one big part of uh, what you can do with Vespa is uh, inference, which is evaluating some machine learn model over your uh, data. Uh, to do that, we have uh, a tensor language that allows you to express all kind of machine learn models in a common uh, language based on tensors. Tensor is a generalization of uh, arrays, matrices, and so on, right, where you can have any number of dimensions. Um, in addition to writing handwriting expressions, mathematical expressions over these tensors, you can also just plug in uh, model directly in uh, that is uh, learned from something like TensorFlow or one of these other machine learning tools um, and plug that directly into Vespa and Vespa will run it for you. So just to give some intuition of that, if you have used something like TensorFlow, you're used to these graphs you see uh, on the left here. Um, which is a representation of some computation you want to do over your uh, tensors. Uh, in Vespa, that's translated to a mathematical expression, uh, equivalent mathematical expression, uh, using uh, tensor operators. I'll get into some more detail on that uh, time permitting. Um, since this conference is also about ops. I'll mention some ops details uh, briefly. So we released Vespa uh, to production in our system and to the public uh, four times a week, at least on good weeks. Um, it has taken us a long time to get to that. It's the releases and verification and so on is all completely automatic, so we don't touch it, and if nothing is broken, it will just uh, run out, uh, go to production by itself. So we have a suite of about 1,100 functional tests or Vespa and about 75 performance tests that stores the performance history and fail the test if there is deviation in performance uh, above some tolerance. Um, also before we push the release, Publicly, we have upgraded all of the about 150 production applications in our own uh, cloud system. So the releases that go publicly are verified in both these ways. So they are pretty good. So we uh, advise our external users to create a process where they also do CD on these releases uh, at least a couple of times a week because the risk of doing it is low as long as you automate uh, all the steps to actually do it. Uh, we do all the development of Vespa in the open on github.com, so there's no mirroring and it's not behind or anything like that. It's all in the open and we encourage anybody to uh, contribute if they like. Okay, so that was an introduction to Vespa. So to summarize, the point of Vespa is to be able to make decisions over big data in real time, which is what I call uh, big data serving. Um, you can find it on Vespa.ai, and you can run 
there you can also find a tutorial that allows you to run an application on your own in less than 10 minutes, and a bigger one where you start with some public blog data set, and you create a blog search and recommendation engine using a neural net. So that's pretty nice. It takes a day or something that, uh, to run through it, but then you have actually built your own application doing both search and recommendation. So I'll spend the... Uh, this is a pretty large deck, so I won't cover everything, but I'll talk about a few key points about using Vespa, which is, illustrates more general uh, stuff. So to install Vespa, we either provide RPM packages and we also provide Docker images. And you just install the same image or packages on all the nodes that you want to run Vespa, and then you set a single configuration variable, which points to the administration and config cluster. And that's it. After that, you don't touch the individual nodes at all. Um, instead, you create what we call uh, an application package, which is a complete description, declarative description of your application that you want to run. And you create this application package and deploy it to Vespa, and Vespa will set up the system and run that application for you. Whenever you make a change to your application, you just change your application package and deploy again, and Vespa will figure out the difference between what you're already running and what you want to run, and then carry out the changes uh, in a safe manner while uh, executing your queries. Um, this style of configuration is called manifest-based uh, configuration, and it's the only way to go for uh, big systems. So the alternative to this is what is commonly used is that the configuration of your live system is really uh, the sum of the history of individual changes that were made in some command line tool or some graphical uh, interface, which means that the only way to analyze the running system and know what it is doing is to uh, inspect all the details about how the system is uh, configured uh, currently. And in some cases, you also need to know the history, right? While in Vespa, you have a complete description of the system in your application package, and that defines the system that you're actually running. It doesn't matter what history you have or prior changes which means the application package can just be checked into a source repository, and then you can just have a process that downloads from that source repository, build your application package, and deploy it, and you have a CD of your system. Obviously, you need testing as well. So what goes into an application package in Vespa? They can be really large and contain lots of Java code, machine learn models, all kinds of stuff. But the minimum is just one file that describes the clusters you want to run and what uh, properties they should have. Uh, then you need a list of the host you want to run the system on. And lastly, you need uh, schemas for your data, which is just collection of fields. And for each of the fields, you say, are the index, attribute, things like that. And then your uh, scoring is also tied to the um, schemas, so they are part of your uh, schema as well. Or they refer to the schema. They can be machine learning models and so on in more complex uh, examples. So to use Vespa, you can use a simple REST API to post changes, get documents, and execute queries, and so on. Um, to operate it, as I mentioned, there's no single point of failure, so you don't need to uh, do anything outside working hours, usually, as long as you have uh, uh, sufficient capacity to handle failures. Um, there's also a log component that collects the log to a single uh, point, and there's metrics integration. Um, this stuff I'll skip. Yeah, this is to give you some intuition about how queries are actually executed. 
So we have a container, a stateless container that handles the incoming queries. It contains some middleware for that knows how to execute a given query. It will fan out to all the content partitions that are relevant for a query in parallel. Those content partitions will do matching and do the first phase of your uh, ranking function, and then a second phase ranking function if you have, then it will group and aggregate over all your data, and then finally return the result upwards. And then it might be some back and forth here to actually execute the entire query across all the nodes. And then finally you return the end result back to the users. So ranking and inference in Vespa is just math, as I mentioned. You can have ranking functions over just scalar features, which is what you typically use for text search, where you use things like a GBDT model, gradient boosted decision trees. But you can also have functions over tensors that allows you to uh, express more complex uh, machine learn models like deep neural nets and things like that. Uh, so a tensor is a generalization of scalars, vectors, matrices, and so on, where you can have any number of dimensions uh, of your data. Um, you can put them in your documents, you can send them with your queries, and you can put them in your application package. And that together allows you to create all kinds of machine learned models. Um, then we have a tensor math language that allows you to compute all the tensors at serving time. There are just six operators, but they are generic enough that we can add, express all the kinds of operators that you find in things like TensorFlow uh, and so on. So we have a long list of operators that we support that are really just expressed in terms of these more primitive uh, operators. Uh, this is really cool, but uh, I'll skip it anyway. So here's an example of how to uh, create a model with uh, tensors. It can do a lot with a very small um, expression. So in this case, we have a model called follow the regularized leader, which is something Google published for the ad system a few years back, where the idea is you just do a logistic regression, but you do it over combinations of all your uh, primitive features. So you create combinations of all your primitive features to capture non-linearities, and that gives you typically a few million features, and then you just do a standard logistic regression to learn a model, basically a set of weights for all these combinations of features. Right? But how do you compute this model in real time? Well, if you have tensors, it's really simple. This is the literal actual uh, model as you write it in Vespa. This is the whole thing. What you do is you have your uh, feature tensors. In this case, you have three feature tensors. For example, you may have a user location tensor, a user interest tensor, and an article topic tensor. And then you want to generate, you want to combine these sensors, taking the uh, tensor product of all these tensors. So that is just multiplying these three tensors with three different dimensions together. And then when you have all these combinations, you want to take your combinations and look up the weight for uh, each of the combinations. And that you do by joining these three tensors with a model tensor, which, have, which is three-dimensional and have all these three dimensions and a weight for each uh, value. So that's your learn model. And then when you have this combination, you just sum, and that's your logistic uh, regression. So that's really neat. Um, you can also express neural nets pretty uh, simple, simply with this kind of uh, math. But this is still somewhat cumbersome for people to do, so we have uh, TensorFlow and ONX integration out of the box that allows people to just learn a model in one of these learning tools and save it to the application package and deploy, and Vespa will do the translation for you and run it for you. This I mentioned. So, uh, 
I think I'll stop there because I think we're out of time. Uh, if you need to have some time for questions. So, summary again, big data serving is about deferring computation to uh, the time when you actually need to use that uh, computation. And the computation needs to happen, so happen over lots of data. It's a difficult problem, but you can use Vespa.ai to help you solve it. And then it should be doable for a lot more people that are actually doing it uh, today. And that's all I'm going to say, I think. So do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your talk, John. And we have two questions for you. The first one is, is Vespa designed more for simple end user searches, or does it also save for complex business intelligence queries and build real-time business decisions? If so, how does query complexity affect latency or performance? <laughs> That's a very big question. So. Uh, uh, business intelligence, usually it's in the analytics space. So I would say, uh, if you look back at, that's a long way. Uh, this slide, it's more on the left side than the right side, unless you defer the decisions to when it's actually going to be used by end users. and. Yes, query complexity definitely impacts performance, but what impacts performance most is how many, typically it's how many documents do you want to evaluate each query, or how many documents are matching a query, and how complex are your machine learning models. That's the most important factors, really. So not really query complexity as such. Okay. Thank you. And the other question, an attendee says, we run an online business for a clothing retail company. At the moment, our content is aesthetic and our campaign is manually crafted. Do you think Vespa could help us to automate and tailor our user-facing content for each customer? And in your experience, what's the usual time to implement and deploy these improvements in a well-established system? Yeah, that's a good question. So we just recently uh, released uh, uh, e-commerce use case where you you get as open source a uh, Vespa application that implements uh, shopping search with browsing, searching, recommendation, and so on. It even includes a simple front end, so you can see how it looks. So that would be a good starting point for that. And yes, it's a very common use of Vespa. Uh, I know some big systems that are using Vespa for this and uh, that are on the billion in uh, revenue size. So it's definitely used for that kind of uh, use case on how much effort it is to put it into use on an existing system. That depends. When we open source, we had some people that started using it uh, the first week that went into production in less than three months with all their use cases, in that case it was both search and recommendation and also type ahead uh, search that they built from scratch on Vespa, three different applications. So it's possible to do it fairly fast, but we also have some very big capable companies that are spending years in analysis and discussing and testing this and that and so on before they actually go into production. So it's hard to say and in general, it varies. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.